Hey everyone, my name is Andrew Warner, and uh, this is kind of weird because today's guest is, well, in my office, but not right here. We put him in a conference room, even though he's here in in the flesh. We had lunch together. We're drinking chai together. But um, I wanted to isolate his audio, so we put him in a different room there. He's got the same chai as I do. I really hope I could do a good job with this interview because we had this freaking killer lunch where we just talked about so many different things. We talked about, and the guest I should say is Ben Yu. He is the founder of multiple companies. The one that you might be more familiar with is called Sprayable. They make this thing where you spray your neck called Sprayable Energy, and it gives you energy, kind of like drinking um, uh, an energy drink without having to consume a drink. They also have this thing called Sprayable Sleep, where you sp- spray your neck and it helps you fall asleep. And I thought the whole thing was bullshit, to be honest with you, for a long time. But I looked up the reviews and people really are getting a lot of results from this thing. So even the cynical part of me is impressed. Um, but man, there's so much else to talk to him about. I want to know about how he built up this company. I want to know why he's not there running it now. I want to know why, even though he's got the successful company, the guy's living in an RV I want to know how, when he's in San Francisco, he can live for $10,000 a year. It costs me, no exaggeration, $10,000 a month to live here. Um, I want to know about why he donates bone marrow. I want to know about his divorce. I want to know about what happened with his co-founder. I want to know uh, how he got a car for free. I want to know about the friend of his who flies free for life. How do you fly free for life? Uh, man, there's so many things that I want to find out. But the thing that most excites me that I think is interesting for you is he had this failure. He regrouped. He found an idea that seemed a little out there, like spraying your neck and getting, you know, energy, getting sleep. It worked. It took off as a business and he's able to run it or to keep it going, even though he's not there day to day. So we're going to find out about that all thanks to two companies. The first is this new drink that I've got right here. I'll tell you about it. It's called, um, Athletic Greens. I've got a whole bunch of it over here. And the second is a company you've heard me talk about forever. It will help you hire your next great developer. It's called Top Tal the First. Ben, good to have you here. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Ben, in private, you told me how much revenue Sprayable has. I'm not going to reveal it, but I do want to give you an opportunity. How much revenue are you guys doing with Sprayable? Yeah, we're in the mid seven figures. Mid seven figures. Seven mm-hmm. figures meaning over a million dollars, obviously. Exactly. Eight figures meaning 10. So somewhere in the middle between those two is where you guys are. Profitable? Yep. Okay. Um, and as I said, this is not your first company. You got a Teal Fellowship. You were one of the first people to get it. Then you went and started a company that didn't do so well. Let's go back in time. How'd you find out about the Teal Fellowship and what is it? Absolutely. Yeah. So I actually dropped out of school. I dropped out of Harvard before I found out about the Teal Fellowship because I was uh, just super unhappy at Harvard, you know, suicidal, um, just didn't job for me. So I dropped Wait, out. Wait, sorry. Yep. Let me pause for a second on suicidal. What Absolutely. led you to feel suicidal? Yeah, you know, I actually had a childhood that, you know, I was super shy, super awkward, fat, overweight, um, you know, had no friends. And ultimately, you know, just like all these reasons that my life was not in a good place. And so because of that, you know, I'd always been depressed, became distinctly suicidal at, uh, in eighth grade middle school, and then had constantly become suicidal all the way through until yeah, freshman year of college. When you say suicidal, was it just constantly this feeling of, I don't want to live or was it, I think I've got a plan? Yeah, it went, uh, it progressively got worse, right? So at first it's just like, wow, I really don't want to live, right? And then by the time I got to Harvard, uh, that first semester, someone jumped off a building and you know, commit suicide. From that moment, halfway through the year, I was just like, uh, all I could think about was killing myself, right? And so, but the only thing that really stopped me, of course I say this, but um, the only thing that stopped me was I'm like, oh, I only get one chance to do it. I might as well make it amazing, right? And so I'm like, I'm going to either buy a pufferfish or a golden dart frog. And they have like TTX uh, neurotoxins, right? And I'm like, no one's ever, I've never heard of anyone dying like this. So I'm going to make it happen. But um, So that, wait, plus, the, the pufferfish is how you said you were going to kill yourself? Pufferfish or golden dart frog, yeah. Okay. I thought both of those were, I had yeah. no idea. That's really creative, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I think Thanks before you... Uh, James Altucher had the most creative way of killing himself. He got very explicit. I'll leave it for his interview for anyone who wants to go listen. But you decided, I'm not going to do it. Instead, I'm going to go live all out as long as I can. Since I'm going to kill myself anyway, I might as well do. So what's the most outrageous thing you did soon after coming to that conclusion? Yeah. So I got uh, carried down in a stretcher from Kilimanjaro just like a couple months later. Um, So, you know, I read this book by Michael Crichton called Travels, and he just inspired me, right? Like he had similar stories at Harvard really want to find himself. So he went and traveled to all these distinct places. One of them was he went to Tanzania and climbed Kilimanjaro. I'm like, that sounds amazing, right? So I did the same thing, but then I uh, got high altitude sickness. 
decided it would be horrible if I just failed on the second day out of this five day hike. So I'm like, no matter what, I'll get to the top of this mountain. I realized that's the wrong goal to have. The right goal should be to get to the top of the mountain and back down again. And so I get to the top and then I just realized six hours later, there's no way I can get down this thing. So they ultimately had to carry me down in the stretcher. But um, yeah, that was nice. Got mugged on my first day in Africa, all the normal stuff. Got I some see. So it, before this, were you someone who was more sedentary, who stayed in the U.S. more? You were. Yeah. So that was my first time traveling alone internationally. The only international trip I had done before then was when I was 13 with my family to China. So yeah, it doesn't really count. And I was like, yeah, if I'm going to do this, I know that one, if I stay in school, I'll kill myself. So I need to do something else right now. It seems like the right thing to do is just travel. I have no plans, whatsoever. No idea what I'll do. Just know I'm unhappy with what I'm doing right now. And I should go somewhere that has been radically different from what I've experienced in my life to date, right? Which has been this kind of insular bubble of, you know, American suburban or college culture. And so I'm like, I'll go to Africa, right? That seems very different. And so, you know, I'll go to Tanzania and then like, you know, just have this wild experience, get mugged within hours of landing in the country, um, don't eat for two days and then realize it's like, oh, wow, maybe this is a horrible mistake <laughs> and maybe this is why people stay in school. But, uh, and then things got a lot better from there. Okay. That really is dramatic. All right. And then you leave school. Peter Thiel at the time made this big announcement. People, sh- smart people, some people shouldn't graduate. Instead, they should go out and start companies. He decided he was going to put his money where his mouth was. Was he, um, in the Thiel Fellowship, was he giving you guys money or was he investing in your company? He was just straight out giving you money. So how and much so, money did you get from Peter Thiel? It was $100,000 over two years. Yep. In your bank account, personal account? Exactly, okay. personal money. And you're not sitting on it and you know just investing it. You're not going to Mount Kilimanjaro for five or six more trips. Instead, you start a business. What was the idea for the business? Yeah, so it was a amalgamation between Google Product Hunt, if you guys remember that, so, or Product Search, if you remember that, and like a deals forum, like Slick Deals. And you know, I'm a super kind of deal happy kind of guy and I love getting good deals. And so for me, I realized that there was a perfect opportunity for someone to make something that was easily searchable that would have the best crowdsourced deals. Machines could find the best deals people could, but machines could organize things better. Right. And so if you could amalgamate the two together, that'd be the ideal thing. Unfortunately, I had absolutely no experience running a company, managing anything, doing anything with tech. And so they just horribly crashed, failed and burned so in like six months. A whole hundred thousand goes away. Uh, 50,000. So half of it, cause you know, I get over two years. So thankfully they were smart enough not to give me all the money. And what were you going to do with the other 50,000 or what did you end up doing with the other 50? Well, I learned my lesson pretty quickly from that. Right. So I'm like, wow, this is just a horrible experience. Absolutely failed. Right. Like totally unqualified for this. And so with the next 50, that's a, I'm super thankful that, you know, I had this opportunity to burn all this money, waste it, and then start living an incredibly frugal life. And so that's when I started living for, you know, less than 10,000 a year. How do you live in San Francisco for less than 10,000 a year? Well, it turns out San Francisco is one of the cheapest places to live if you do it right, because it's incredibly heavily VC subsidized, right, with all these startup industries. And so the only outsized expense is rent. So if you can take out rent, everything else at most is just marginally more than anywhere else. And so, you know, rent is like two to five X more than anywhere else, but other things are maybe 20, 30 percent more. And so for me, I live in an RV on the side of the street, pay zero dollars in rent, have been doing it for three and a half years. And then everything else you can cut down like Groceries can be 100 to $200 a month. And then almost everything else, like meals, I used to get free for an entire year. How? Using, say, referral codes from um, all the startups in the area, right? Like Sprig and Munchery and so forth. So Sprig opens up. They say, we're going to give you $10 worth of food for every friend that you get to sign up. I, I used to see this in lots of apps. As soon as you open it up, the first thing they do is not tell you how to buy food, but insist that you tell your friends. So you went and found, how, how did you find so many friends who are going to sign up using your referral code so you can eat for free? No, yeah, that's a great question. So there are a couple of ways to do it, but um, ultimately, like what a lot of people did, myself included, is that uh, you can run extremely cheap ads for a lot of these things, right? And like, you know, it costs you cents on the dollar to get people to sign up and do all this. And so, you know, did this with Uber, got about $2,000 in free Uber rides, did this with, you know, Sprig and all that, and, like got free meals for a year. And then luckily, uh, my, uh, my wife at the time actually worked at uh, Google. So then I just uh, ate at Google every day too and lived on their campus in an RV. So lots of ways. Okay, so I get how you're now living on the cheap. Your first idea didn't work out. I want to understand a little bit more about why that idea didn't work out and then where the idea for Sprayable came from, how you grew Sprayable and so on. One of the things you told me was there was an issue with your co-founder. Talk about the co-founder issue with the previous business. Absolutely. Yeah, so this was the biggest lesson I learned by far, right? It was, there was always this mantra that as I came out here, you know, as a naive first-time founder, I was like, oh, you, know, you need co-founders. Everyone says you need co-founders. Mm-hmm. Let me get some co-founders. 
And so it was a friend from, you know, it was an acquaintance really from Harvard who, you know, heard that beginning tail fellowship. It was like, oh, wow, you know, this seems like an interesting thing. I should jump on board. And so we worked together. And then I realized that, you know, we were only acquaintances and there's a reason that we weren't other friends. And like the fact that we weren't friends did not bode well for the fact that we were going to be good co-founders. And then I realized, you know, let's say zero is being solo, having no co-founders, right? Having a good co-founder is infinitely plus EV, right? And then uh, plus expected value. Uh, having a n- poor co-founder is just absolutely the worst thing ever, right? It's exactly negative in the opposite direction. And so, yeah, ultimately I realized, you know, um, the most important thing is to find the right people to start something with and don't, you would far be better off doing something alone than doing it with the wrong people. Wait, but it's an acquaintance, someone who you don't hate. You didn't end up in an argument. Did you end up in an argument? Over time, absolutely. Yeah. So it turned out, you know, and like there was a very, there were a lot of valid points, right? The other fundamental things is even without this co-founder thing, it would have failed because I just absolutely had no idea how to make a product, fundraise, find product market fit, get a business model, build this product, anything, right? And so there are a lot of other latent reasons. So it never went anywhere. I don't even see it on your LinkedIn profile. Exactly. Exactly. So where did the money go? So the money just uh, dissipated into thin air, really, right? And so it went to a lot of legal fees. It went to, um, you know, like, putting everyone up in San Francisco and all these things, right? So I was burning like just a ton of money, basically getting this team of three people together, right? For On salaries or on finding them? On salaries, on housing, on legal. So I was covering basically all the costs for running this I entire see. Okay. Company. All right. That's not yeah. crazy then considering what you were doing. Um, your own personal housing or their housing too? Their housing too, yeah. Wow. So okay. All right. So you lose it all. You decide it's time to close it up. Mm-hmm. Um, why didn't you want to kill yourself at that point? Now you had a bona fide failure after being yeah. basically this celebrity. I see articles about you, right? Peter Thiel thought you were great. Why didn't you go through a, through a, a downward spiral? Yeah, that's a really good question. And so I asked this to myself too, right? There was definitely a moment of like, wow, it's like, I've really fucked up, right? Like things are just like bad, right? But, um, ultimately, you know, I had, I had two theories and the first theory that I used to have, and I told myself this as a story was that. You know, the reason I was suicidal before was fundamentally because I didn't have real agency over my life, right? I was just following this default path. It's like you go to school, right? And then you go to college, right? And then you find a job and then you get married and you have a house, right? And you live this life that I put as you should. And for the first time, I'd been able to get off that be- uh, that beaten path, right? And to live a life that was more true to you know, what I actually want to do. But in retrospect, I actually think maybe that's not it at all. Maybe I was just sleep deprived. And from eighth grade to uh, freshman year of college, I was just incredibly sleep deprived in school and coming out of that, I was able to sleep actually nine hours a day. And I think, um, people really do downplay the importance of like having good physiological health, especially when you're star founder, right? Like it's so important to just keep care of your sleep. I know when I was in school, I really was sleep deprived too. I had terrible insomnia. And then of course you have to wake up at a certain time and you have yeah. to just go, go, go. It's really rough. And it's mm-hmm. hard to dig yourself out of insomnia. It's hard to break free of it, partially because I remember kind of beating myself up over it. I would get into this negative cycle, right? I couldn't call, I'd get to bed by 10 saying, all right, this is when Deepak Chopra in his CD says you have to go to sleep. I'm in bed by 10. Then 1030 comes around and go, oh, I'm such a failure. Half an hour is already gone. Then you look down at 1130 and go, why did I waste an hour and a half? I could have been productive. And now what if it doesn't work out to one o'clock? And you know, and you just keep going through this self-talk that is really, um, uh, uh, debilitating. Okay. All right. Why don't we, before we get into sprayable, let's talk about one thing that you've done just to give people a sense of who you are. This bone marrow donation, you were checking in to come into my building. The security guard wanted to see your ID. A card came out and you said, this has to do with bone marrow. I said, hang on, don't tell me too much. I want to know in the interview, what's the donate to bone marrow thing? Yeah. So it turns out uh, you can do, I have a good friend who uh, suffered from leukemia, Amit Gupta. And so he did this whole mobilization drive for bone marrow. And there's a I remember bit- that. I, yeah. I went and I got my, my mouth swab because of that's him. That's amazing. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, he did an amazing job, right? He single-handedly like, saved the lives of so many people and mobilized right. so many people to start this thing. And there's this huge myth. It's a huge problem that bone marrow donation is thought of as this extremely painful thing, right? But uh, it's actually painless. Um, they anesthetize you, actually. And like even so, even if it's not, it's uh, reasonably straightforward. Um, so you can actually go to a lab here in California. It's called Luco Lab, and they do this for research. They take your bone marrow for research. And they'll give you 500 bucks for it too, right? So it takes like 30 minutes. You go in there, you do something good, and you get $500. I'm always a sucker for, yeah, free things. So you did it. And you got 500 bucks. Yeah, exactly. So I had a sense that you lost all $100,000, and that's why you had to resort to donating your bone marrow to finding free Uh, food. uh, It's not it. You just got a sense of caution about money because of that? 
but inherently you are someone who likes to save money. And all this expression of saving money is not due to a dire situation. It's just who you are. That's why you live in an RV. That's why you're looking for free food. It's a mix of both. There was a point at which I came extremely close to not having money, and there's absolutely no way I could have made it work without having lived this RV lifestyle, right? At what point did like, you get to that? Yeah, so this is uh, early 2014, right, when we're just about to take off with Sprayable, and we're not taking a salary yet, right? We're still bootstrapped, and we just, we're just starting to produce, produce this thing, and I have like maybe $20,000 in the bank left, right? I actually dropped like you know half of it into cryptocurrency or something, right? And this is like back in like 2013. And like the price instantly creators 80%. So I lose all the money. I'm like, wow, I'm totally screwed at this point, right? And so it's like, all right, the only way I can make rent work in San Francisco is to live in an RV, right? And so like a lot of this stuff did come out of necessity. But at the same time, I am like very cautious about uh, kind of financial uh, reliability and having something to depend on because, you know, I grew up reasonably poor and, um, you know, it was a huge point of stress in like our early life, right? Not- like, well, what's an example of something that your parents couldn't afford that led you to feel stress going up? growing up yeah yeah so i always lived in the poorest housing and uh, you know i was on the reduced lunch program in uh, high school and had a full financial aid ride to harvard and all that and every the distinctive memories i had as a child were that uh every sunday morning my mom like always clip spend hours clipping all the coupons right for everything and that's how we afford like all the food we got and my dad was not as financially savvy as my mom and so like his whole model was as long as people are willing to lend you money still you're totally fine right like there's nothing to worry about and so he decides to go to China to start his own company in middle school my time. And my mom, who has never managed finances before, realizes that we have $100,000 in credit card debt. And she's worked as a cashier at Home Depot, right? Just like a normal retail job for like 15 years now. And so she's like, holy crap, how am I possibly going to pay off $100,000 of credit card debt? And so all throughout high school, it was just like this immensely stressful thing, right? Where like we weren't sure if we'd ever like get by or have to go bankrupt or something like that. And did you at that point say to yourself, I can never let myself lose money. I could never become like my dad. I have to work extra hard to avoid this. I was always, it's always been something for me where like some parts of, you know, my parents kind of like my dad's like kind of like lifestyle in this regard, right. has been a cautionary tale. And I've always been worried that maybe like there's some genetic fate, right. And I will end up the same way. So absolutely that has been true, but it didn't take me until my first experience personally dealing with so much money and wasting it. Until it was like a serious wake up call. And it's like, all right, I got to be like my mom and do this, right? I see. So. Okay, I'm going to go to Sprayable, but let me take a moment here to talk about my sponsor. The sponsor is at, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you can. Athletic Greens. And it took me a while to get on camera here with you because as soon as we got back from lunch, I made this shake. Um, and I have to be honest with you. Just like I was a little suspicious, maybe a lot of suspicious about your spray. Also, when I found out about Athletic Greens, I wasn't 100% sure that I want to take powder into my system. I I eat really well. I eat salads. You saw me, right? I ate a vegetarian, light, more than you guys, but kind of light-ish lunch. So why would I even want to put powders into my body? And the reason is this. I've kind of fallen behind in my nutrition. I got stressed from working too much. I didn't have much time in the middle of the day. So instead of going out and having the quinoa lunch that you saw me eat today with you, I started to go downstairs and have pizza. And I would end my day with some chips sometimes. And um, I would have a lot of Diet Coke until the founder of Spartan Race said, Andrew, I'm going to come beat you up if you keep drinking diet soda. So I, I finally committed to not drinking it. So I wasn't eating a lot of salads. I didn't have time for it. And my body and my mind were starting to sag. I was starting to feel like, like droopy and heavy and lazy. And it's, it's just, it's weird how what I eat affects my mind. I don't even think it's a chemical reaction. I think I start to feel like a failure because I failed to eat healthy. And so then uh, someone on my team, Sachit Gupta said, do you know about athletic greens? Sachit works with Tim Ferriss. He said, Tim Ferriss swears by this stuff. You should try it. I said, maybe he sent me a box of this stuff. You saw it. It's like every freaking thing in the goddamn lineup he sent me over. And I tried it and I like it. And I do feel better for it. I don't eat junk food because of it. And I feel like not exactly like eating salad, frankly. I think when I eat a big bowl of salad, I feel better. I love it, but I don't have time for it. So I'm doing this and it's taking me to the, it's making me feel better and it's, and it's helping me get back on track. At the end of this, I remember the very next day after I drank it the first time, I got back on the treadmill in the office and I started working out a little bit more while, while working. So Athletic Greens, if you guys are out there and you want to improve your nutrition, check out um, not athleticgreens.com, but go to athletic athleticgreens.com slash mixergy. And the reason is 
that, well, first, you'll be doing me a solid. I'll get um, credit for introducing you to Athletic Greens. And third, and second, you're going to get 30% off your first order from them. Check it out as much as I did. You'll see that people who you respect, who know about nutrition, actually will recommend Athletic Greens. And people who've taken it have given it, um, I was going to say nothing but positive reviews, but I'll be honest, I saw some negative reviews, and largely they had to do with the price, that it was a little more expensive than the other stuff. But it's significantly less expensive than buying soda from the vending machine over here, and it's significantly better for my health. So I'm drinking Athletic Greens. I've got the green juice right here, uh, right here in the packet. I also have the whey protein. I am vegetarian. You're you're vegan. How do you get protein in your system? I'm going to be doing it through Athletic Greens. What's your what's your process for getting protein? Good question. Yeah, very similar. I do have a protein shake that I use, but also nutritional yeast. I've found is amazing. Nutritional protein. yeast is so delicious, guys. Guys, I'm going to close out this ad by telling you go check out athleticgreens.com/mixergy. But I've got to pick up on what Ben said. Get nutritional yeast. Put it on popcorn. It's delicious on your salad. Right. Yeah. That's a little bit expensive. Uh, I think it's a little much to tell someone go spend money like seven bucks on athletic and nutritional yeast, but it's worth it. What do you put it on? Yeah. The cheaper way is to just buy tofu and that also works great. But to I buy actually what? Just, eat, just buy tofu. Oh, yeah, tofu. Just, yeah. 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 So and I, with, and uh, I do like tofu. I saw you had it for lunch. I think most people don't like it. What do you put your uh, nutritional yeast on? I actually just eat nutritional yeast straight. I'm a huge fan of umami. And I realize everything I like is umami, so I can just eat a bottle of nutritional yeast. I could too, else. but I thought it wasn't good. What I do is I will make um, edamame from uh, Trader Joe's, just put it in the microwave five and a half minutes. It's steamed up nicely, and then if I put on top of it some salt and nutritional yeast, oh, every time I pull it, pull out the beans with my teeth, I get nutritional yeast, a little bit of salt. So good. That was great. All right, let's come back to your story. So. You're someone who saw that people were taking an energy drink, excuse me, energy through energy drinks and coffee, but you don't like, uh, you don't like these drinks. Why not? What was your problem with them? Yeah. So they actually solved the, what we did with spirit was we solved two of my fundamental pain points. So yeah, the first one was actually, I lack an enzyme to metabolize caffeine. Right. And so for me, I actually took, you can take the 23 and me DNA test and they'll tell you this, right. And there's a specific enzyme. I only express half of it, so I lack one gene out of the two genes that you need, which means that when I drink a cup of coffee or an energy drink, it gets me way too jittery, right? Way too wired because I just cannot process it as fast as someone else, right? So you get this huge spike all at once, right, when you take this thing, and that just never gets out of my system. So instead of making me feel productive, I just feel like a zombie, right? I can't go to sleep, but I also can't get anything done, right? And so unfortunately, I also suffer from having a horrible relationship with sleep, right? I just, like, despite it being the most important thing for me, get suicidal without it but like i cannot get myself to sleep so many times i have no self-control around it and so i still get tired like a normal person but there's no good solution out there for me like coffee or anything else and so you know one day i'm just like all right this is enough there has to be a better solution here and my dad is a phd in chemistry um i you know have a background in a lot of uh, biochem and realized that you know caffeine's molecule is very structured uh very structurally similar to nicotine which if you see a nicotine patch right it goes through skin really well i'm like oh i wonder if there's something we can do here and then i realized if we could if we could make it go through a skin you could absorb it much more smoothly and much more gradually than with a cup of coffee or an energy drink where you get it all at once and so now that's something that works great for me and also for anyone else who wants something that will just give them nice smooth energy not this roller coaster ride of you know a buzz and jitters at the beginning and then crash at the end but something that will just let you feel like you took a great nap right and just woke up refreshed and solid Okay, so you had this vision for what it could be. Our producer asked you about it and you said, you know, the thing I wish I'd done at that point is just launch sooner. Instead of launching early, what did you do? Where did your time go? Yeah, so again, yeah, this is why I don't understand why anyone invests in uh, first-time founders, but I'm glad they did for us. So we just spent like a year building this thing before we even validated that anyone What do you mean by building it? So it was a lot of R&D in our case, right? So we actually had to, it was about half a year of actually just like trying different things, right? To see what worked the best, trying on different people and all like that. What? And I, I kind of picture you guys taking coffee, putting it in a spray <laughs> bottle and spraying it on your neck and seeing if that does anything. But it's not that. It's more than that. What did you do? Right. So the, the key kind of breakthrough is that we needed a carrier molecule that could take caffeine and transport it through the skin, which it normally does to a small degree, but not to the degree that you need to have a good effect, right? And so we needed something that could just increase the solubility of caffeine in aqueous solution, as well as increase its potency, right? And so it took a lot of trial and error to find the right molecule 
And ultimately, we did a derivative of the amino acid uh, tyrosine, right? That's naturally produced by the body. Super safe, but like it uh, is just an amazing carrier molecule. So it has no active kind of uh, impact of its own because it's in such small amounts, but it just allows you to have really good caffeine delivery. How do you know? So, what was your process for finding this out? Yeah, no, no. So there's a lot of... Um, Actually, we did build off some work that my father has done. He's worked with transdermals for a long time, right? And has been an eminent researcher in that space. And so he specifically had been altering the direct molecule themselves, like uh, aspirin, right? And making that transdermal. But that you have to go through clinical trials for because you're changing the molecule. So what we wanted was a way to kind of have the same benefit, but without changing the molecule. So what we realized is we needed something that could basically encapsulate our caffeine molecule and transport through. And so like the tyrosine surrounds it and makes it easy to transport um, and then that was just like, all right, let's find all these different ways that have similar molecules to what, you know, this research in the past is discovered is good and then just see what works best. You got investment from what's Palapa Ventures and StartX? Oh, good question. So StartX is a, it's a Stanford StartX accelerator fund, right? So it's actually Stanford University's investment vehicle for companies that come out of Stanford affiliated programs. And so StartX is the premier kind of a, accelerator incubator in Stanford, but um, they also had a visiting fellows program. So because I was part of Harvard, you know, they was. And Which that, one of you went to Stanford? Was it your co-founder, Devin so- uh, Sonny? Sonny, yeah. Sonny? So Devin, Devin went to Berkeley, but no, actually they had a visiting fellows program. And so, yeah, it was just because I went to Harvard that, you yeah, know, they would also allow people who went to Harvard to kind of I that. see. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then they invested in you. How much money did they put in? Yeah, so they always put in 10%, basically, of any round that someone gets. Okay, and then Palapa Ventures, um, I don't know much about them. Yeah, I- yeah. So our, our predominant investors were actually uh, Simon Black from, um, that's a pseudonym, but he runs SovereignMan.com, and he put together a syndicate, basically, right, that did the majority of our rounds. And then Palapa Ventures was a, a good friend who also came through a Starlux network who really liked what we did, right? They just I put see. In. I was looking at Crunchbase, and Crunchbase is not 100% on this stuff. Yeah. Okay. How much money did you raise total? About $2 million. $2 million. Yep. And just by going to these people and saying, I'm going to sell this new sprayable thing, why did they believe in you enough to create a syndicate, to invest in you? Why? Yeah, that's a great question. I'd, I'd love to know that too. But no, uh, really, I, I think they, they definitely saw the... So a lot of it was... It's just like you said, right? Like, it's super good to be skeptical about these things, right? Because so much of it are shams, right? But if you actually try something firsthand and it works for you, then you incontrovertibly know that this thing has value, right? So you had and it so, already working at the time. Exactly, you gave them exactly. this new energy thing. They didn't say to you, dude, I see five hour energy drink in the store. I see Red Bull in the store. I see people walking around with coffee everywhere. This is a solvable problem. Also, people don't want to spray their necks for anything go away and come back with some software company that works on my phone so I could show it to my wife. No, they didn't say any no. of that. No, no, they uh, they really believed in what we're doing and it worked for them, right? And they could see a lot of the benefits that we had over you know these existing things, right? Where one, like uh, it's way cheaper per unit cost and two, a lot of people don't want to, right? Like there's a lot of health uh, side effects, right? With five hour energy, energy drinks, with even coffee and things like that, right? And like people in a lot of cases care about their health. They don't want to sacrifice their health, but they still want to get the energy, right? And what we do is we do exactly that. We give you absolutely nothing that you don't need. We just give you this one active. You're saying just one active ingredient. Yeah, just one active ingredient, caffeine, right? That's what you need. But all these other drinks, they put in so much other stuff in there, right? To try to pretend like they have some competitive advantage where at the end of the day, it just comes out to caffeine, right? Okay, so so where did the extra time go? What were you doing that kept you from launching as fast as you would have in retrospect? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, what we thought is, you know, we needed to make something fully before we could release it. Right. And then we're like, Oh, we'll do an Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign. And then we just like, were rate limited on a lot of logistics about like, uh, making the product, creating the, uh, the bottle and all that, and then getting it all like a uh, filled and all that. And so that took like another six months after we did this whole R&D and patenting process, right? So those were two main components. And yeah, in that time, I wish we just put together a sales page, right? And just like put it out to people and be like, will you pay money for this thing, right? So we can make sure we're not just wasting our time. You told our producer I was too embarrassed at the time. I want to bring that up. What were you embarrassed about? It was my first time launching something public to the world where it was a binary, right? Either we succeed or we fail and everyone will memorialize and remember this for like forever, right? That's just a, such a nerve wracking thing, right? I was like way less confident back then, right? It's the first time doing it. No idea if people would like this thing. And so because of that, we honestly, to be honest, we held off for much longer than we should have, right? Because it's like, all right, let's just like try to make sure everything's fine and all I see. that. So you thought, 
I'm going to spend more time on mi- on improving the mixture. Yeah. But what you really were doing was procrastinating on having somebody reject you. If we're being honest, that's totally it. Exactly. And when you finally got someone to buy, I think it was your roommate who bought it for eight bucks, and you said, "I can't believe you bought." You felt like a like a fraud. Yeah. You felt yeah. like you cheated him somehow. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of internal conflict because on one hand, it was like, oh my God, this is amazing, right? Someone's validated their thing. They'll buy it. But this, at the same time, at the time, this thing was like in the crappiest bottle, right? We had found this thing on Alibaba and like didn't work, right? Like it was just the worst product. I'm like, wow, I can't believe we sold this thing to this poor man who's a friend for real money, right? But um, yeah, at the same time, right? It was like, it's what needed to happen. And like over time, I realized, no, like this wasn't fraud, right? We were selling him something that had real value. And like, yeah. I wish we were shooting this video in your RV the way we were planning on. Um, oh, yeah. So I could see the bottle. You don't have it with you. If no. somebody asks you for it on your Facebook page or on social media, will you show them a photo of it? I will try to find the photo and show them. And yep. it will be embarrassing, you think? It will be horrible. You think they even would think it was embarrassing? Oh, yeah. It just looked like the worst thing ever. It was just like transparent pink rectangle and just horrible. You know, yeah. let me take a step away from this for a second because the next thing you did was Indiegogo and it worked out. But what I'm seeing is a lot of friends, friendship that led you to find your co-founder, right? Devin, mm-hmm. you were close friends. Friendships that led you to find people to um, uh, to buy and to test this with, et cetera. Yeah. How are you making friends all of a sudden? You said that your whole thing was you were a kid who couldn't make friends. What is it about you that suddenly allowed you to make all these friends? I think it's exactly because of that. That's a great question. It's because this has been such a pain point in my life, right? Everything in my life that uh, had been this horrible struggle in childhood is ultimately what made me realize, you know, like it's so important to learn how to make the right friends, right? And to so what do you learn about skills. how to make friends? Well, actually, it happened uh, first because I thought I'd be forever alone and never attracted to any woman ever, right? And so, like, I was horribly afraid of like speaking to any girl when I was in like uh, high school and all that because of mere fact that they were a girl. And then, yeah, there's one girl who was actually my friend and like uh, realized that like, uh, holy crap, maybe I have a chance here. Like, just was super creepy and obsessive and all that for a whole year, right? And it was like, she'll dump her boyfriend for me if I can. In high school, you thought this. In in high school, exactly, right? (laughs) Okay. I get uh, exactly it. right. Yeah, yeah and then, that's the know, way, like, yeah, that's the I'm that's like, yeah. the kind of dork I was. Yes. Yeah. As long as I'm just the most obsessive, creepy person ever, then you know, she dump her boyfriend, and everything would be great. And obviously, you know, the year ended for some reason. She didn't. And that year is like the darkest point of my life. I'm like, life will never get better, right? I will forever be alone, have no friends, just like never be loved. And this, and that's why I like got really suicidal. And then I found David D'Angelo. He was one of the first good internet marketers, right? And he made this book called Double Your Dating. He was a kind of a pickup artist, right? And like a dating expert. And at the time, I was like, wow, this, like, one, feels like a sham, right? Two, it feels like it's going to be a lot of work. But three, either I do this or I kill myself, right? And so, like, the bottom is already set, right? There's no going lower. So I might as well give it a shot. And if it doesn't work, worst case scenario, I just kill myself anyway, right? So I tried that. And it, like, just went from, like, it was like, oh, like, you just have to, within two seconds of seeing a girl or something, right? You just have to say hi, right? And you have to approach. Otherwise, we get too scared. And so I, like, did it and, like, said hi, like, super awkwardly, right? And, like... For some reason, like they actually responded, right? And I was like, holy crap, I went from like zero to 0.01. But that's actually an infinite increase, right? So sophomore year of high school is like the happiest year of my life. And when I did that, that actually is the reason I got into Harvard, the reason I got the deal fellowship, anything else in my life all got predicated from that one moment. Because that's when I realized I had always identified with myself as someone who would always be just forever alone, always unsuccessful, like never be able to do anything like exceptional. But then when I realized I could change this one thing that I felt so strongly about that was tied to my identity, then I, I, I could do anything else, right? So, uh-huh. yep. How old were you the first time you had sex? Uh, 16. 16? Yeah. How'd you... Yeah. I, I was better with making friends and talking to girls than you were. How did I get laid later yeah. than you? What happened at 16? Yeah. Well, the thing was, yeah, once I realized I could, like, make this change, I, like, went all out, right? And so, you know, I read the game, which we talked about earlier. Oh, so this and, happened as, I see, at 15, 16, you were getting into this stuff. Exactly. I got into this like pretty heavily into like 15, right? And then like, because it became such a focus, right? I like really worked on it. And all these things are skills, right? And so like, the more you work on it, the more delivered packets. Yeah, yeah. Want to know something? I didn't read the game in high school. I read Judy Bloom in elementary school and Judy Bloom books were all about falling. Do you know Judy Bloom at all? Oh, all about all. like falling in love as a teenager, finding the one. And so I was like this, this like fourth grader reading those books and that really touched into who I wanted to be. And I didn't lose my virginity till later because I wanted to save myself. I'm a little bad. Yeah. I want to save myself. I would go to sleep going, of course you want to save this precious little thing. Why would you want to? This virginity of mine. That's great. <laughs> um, Worked out for you well. You're married now. 
Yeah, I didn't save it for my wife, but <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the worldview that I had. And I thought that everybody wanted to like have sex all the time. It wasn't until I grew up and could ask anyone anything and get personal that I realized there were a lot of people who first of all waited till a lot later than me, and there were mm -hmm. many more people than I imagined who weren't into sex when they were in high school, who had visions of something else like love, but we were too yeah. embarrassed to admit it. All right, I see. So you're working on yourself. And that also explains why one of the characters from the book, the game, became a friend of yours. Yeah, exactly right. The guy so, who's known as Herbal in the book. What's his real name? His name's Tynan. And yeah, so exactly right. I read the book and you know, they had this prime antagonist, right? Who is the reason that Mystery is like suicidally depressed because his girlfriend's tough to him, right? For this other guy, right? And this other guy happens to be this, like super nerdy eccentric guy named Turbo, right? And so in the book, like Neil Strauss kind of portrays him as this like strange eccentric person that no one really understands. He like buys weird stuff on eBay and somehow he made like a million dollars playing poker and all that. And I was just like, wait, this guy sounds awesome, right? And, like, you know, I went on his website and realized he became an entrepreneur afterwards, right? And he like did all this cool stuff. He wrote a book about how to travel around the world. And he's actually responsible for me, like probably being alive, but also like, you know, uh, traveling and like dropping out of school because he wrote this book called Life Nomadic, which is the reason that it showed you everything you need to do to actually like actually travel, right? The actionable steps, like the backpack to get all the gear, how to get flights for cheap and all that. So I followed step by step everything he said and started traveling. And then once I went to Camp California for the tail fellowship, I realized he lived in San Francisco at the time. So I'm like, hey, yeah, cold emailed him. I'd love to meet up. Met up and uh, spilled tea all over him, <laughs> left without paying, and we became really good friends. So. Uh, wow. I, uh, I'm looking at his book right now. It's free with, with Kindle unlimited. I finally get to use my Kindle unlimited for uh, something. I'll get his, yeah. <laughs> I'll get his book. He does coaching. What kind of coaching does he do? Yeah. So he basically is a life coach in a lot of ways, right? Because what he is an expert at, he is by far one of the most unconventional people who lives terms unapologetically on his own, like uh, terms, right? Lives life on his own terms. And he has done, he is responsible for more good things in my life than anyone else, right? We have an island together in Nova Scotia. He's the reason I got into cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. He's the reason I live yeah, in RV. You know what? Let's so. talk about the island. Who who owns this island with you? Yeah. So I, I don't know if uh, Tynan wants people to be public. So I'd like to. Can I stay. mention who I heard is a rumor and you can tell me if the rumor is <laughs> true or not? Uh, that I think I want to respect Tynan's privacy on that. He's uh, a pretty private this is person. Some pretty famous tech entrepreneurs who are part. I, this, I bet you I can find this online. If I could find it online, will you let me talk about it? If you can find it online, I'm almost certain it's not online. I think that's for a reason. But yeah, there is there are okay. some pretty well known people on this. Yeah, Tynan right. is very Tynan is very particular about his privacy because one, he doesn't want people to find the island because uh, he's afraid that you know people will go there and like it's a we don't have like speaking of people up. just going there out of the blue. So you just call up this guy or email him and you, out of the blue, you say, hey, I want to meet you. I read the book. I like you. I'm living my life partially based on, on what you're doing. Yep. I get it. Maybe kind of a weird thing. He says, sure, come into my life. Mm -hmm. Tam Pham, who works at us here at Mixergy, emailed you out of the blue too. You invite him to your house. Did you fly him or did he fly himself? You know, I think we flew him out. So you um, fly him out. He stays at your house. Till 6 a.m., you guys are playing Risk. You, None of you people go, someone could be a freaking weirdo. He's going to come and rob me. He's going to come let You don't have any of these thoughts. It's just some interesting person connected with my blog post, wants to come over. I'm going to have him in my house. I'm going to have him my lunch. I'm going to take him to lunch. That's just the way life works, huh? Absolutely. I think uh, the thing that I've realized over time is like people lose far more from not saying yes to just random things that happen than they do from things, right? Like, people are always worried about what could go wrong, right? Oh, this guy might be a serial killer, right? And kill us all in sleep. That almost never happens, right? But what almost always does happen is you have an amazing, kind of serendipitous thing, right? And, you know, I learned so much more about Mixergy, right? And, like, all that, because Tam was there, and he helped us a ton with our Facebook bot marketing and all that, right? All right, so. and I'm going to ask you about, uh, by the way, I'm researching this as you are talking. I cannot find a freaking goddamn post that there mentioned who else owns this island. There you go. I want to mention recent. the names because I think I know, <laughs> but uh, if I can't find it, even like in some obscure yeah. post, then then you're right. It is too secret for me to reveal. I'm not going to reveal. All right, let me talk about my sponsor, and then we're going to come back and talk about what you did once you had this idea, how you got people to go to Indiegogo, why this product that actually got you on the map that I see a lot of articles about actually didn't end up being the one. And uh, maybe we'll get into how you got this free car and a couple of and divorce and a couple of other things. But first of all, there's a company called TopTal. Do you know TopTal? 
I've heard you talk about it a lot. <laughs> right. Uh, you know what? That's the big answer right now. People know TopTal because I talked about it. This, these founders of TopTal, kind of like you, they're nomads. When I first heard about TopTal, it was, there's this guy, he lives somewhere in South America. Basically, he got into a cave somewhere, which I thought at the time when I heard the story was a literal cave. And he decided he had this idea for a business and the business took off and Andrew, you should interview him. So I, inter- I interviewed him, uh, Brendan years ago and, um, he talked about how he founded this company, which matches developers who are all over the world with entrepreneurs and businesses who need to hire great developers, how he's obsessive about the details of how he hires and how he matches entrepreneurs up. And they're so happy with the results that he ends up with, uh, with lifelong customers. He must've gotten a lot of customers from that interview. And as a result, years later, when Sachit Gupta said, I'm going to start finding ads for Mixergy. He reached out to him and he said, Hey, does Mixergy even work as a guest? Did you get anything? Got, yeah. He says, well, we're thinking of selling ads at a higher price than we usually would. Would you be interested? They said, yeah. And they bought, they became one of the first advertisers in our new format back when we increased prices tremendously. They've been buying a lot because these ads are freaking effective for them. And the reason is these guys obsess on finding the best developers anywhere in the world on testing them to the point where they either want to kill themselves because they've been tested to death or they feel proud for having survived it. And once they do survive it, they get into this community of developers that TopTal has its top secret. TopTal then goes out and finds good businesses who need to hire developers. And they match those businesses with the right members of their community, with the right, de- with the right developer. So if you're out there and you're looking for a developer and you're frustrated with the path that you've taken or the developers you have are smart, but they're not really exceptionally smart, I really urge you to go check out TopTal. It's T-O-P-T-A-L dot com. Top is on top of your head. Tal is in talent. TopTal dot com slash Mixergy. I'm going to tell you right now that a few of you are going to be frustrated with them and I'll tell you why. If you have nothing but an idea, you're not going to be a good customer for them. If you have nobody to interact with a developer, you're not going to be a good fit for them. But if you have a real business and you're doing really, you're doing well and you're looking for a phenomenal developer, you're going to love TopTal. You're going to send me gifts. So go be, just for introducing you to them. And the same will happen if you introduce someone else to TopTal. Go to toptal.com slash Mixergy where you're going to see a very beautiful model and you're going to get 80 hours of top TopTal developer credit when you pay for your first 80 hours in addition to a no-risk trial period of up to two weeks. All right. Um, The Indiegogo campaign, I saw everywhere. I think it's because this idea is remarkable, right? Caffeine in general, people are obsessed with. A new way to deliver caffeine sounds interesting. Your connection to Peter Thiel, the fact that you're a Thiel fellow was a little extraordinary, right? My sense was, though, that you were good at promotion. What did you do to promote it, to get to get blogs to write about it, to get people to talk about it, and to get people to come to Indiegogo. Yeah, so we learned this strategy in hindsight mostly, but we really lucked out. And so what we did is actually we uh, talked a lot with the PR company behind the Teal Fellowship, right? And of course, they've also done a really good job. A lot of people know about the Teal Fellowship. And what they said was this brilliant thing, which is about media and press is a feeding frenzy, right? They really like to get on top of stories that seem like they're bubbling and being hyped and talked about with other people. So what you want is a lot of people to talk about you at the exact same time, right? So how you engineer that is with a press embargo. And so what you say is, hey, you know, we've got an extremely interesting story coming out. Give them some bullet points, right? So they're interested, but not so much that they can make the story and be like, you know, the news breaks August 20th, right? 10 a.m. PST. If you'd love to hear more under embargo, you know, we'd love to tell you more. And so, and then once they verbally agree to that, you give them all the information so they can write this piece in demands, right? And then all release it exactly at the same time. And you don't actually need that much traction. So on day one, we did this a week before our launch, and we planned everything so poorly. Uh, we launched the exact same day as YC Demo Day, and we had no idea this was going on. And so, like, we talked to a Wall Street Journal reporter, and she's like, I love what you guys are doing, but you realize I can't cover you because, like, YC Demo Day is happening, right? We're like, of course we realize that. That's why we planned it for this time, right? But like we had no idea it was going on. That's what on you said. We were, you were kind of trying to play it off like you were intentionally doing this, but that's ex- not true. Yeah. Ex- oh yeah, not at all. Right. Like we were ironically just so heads down focused on what we were doing that we had no idea what else was going on in the world. Right. So just like passed by our heads until the last minute. And so we were just like talking to ourselves. We we're like, wow, we're totally screwed. Right. There's no way this can work. At the same time, I just decided to go back to Harvard for a semester because we'd been rate limited on things. So I'm like, oh, like I can totally balance this with like you know doing school. And my co-founder, Devin, decided to get married the exact same week that we launched, right? So on, like, launch day, we only had three people, uh, three or four people cover us. We had Fast Company, Inc., uh, Business Week, and TechCrunch, right? They all covered us on day one. But that alone was enough. So first day, by the end of the day, we had about 10 people covering us from that four, first four. And then the next day, ABC Good Morning America calls us, right? And they're like, we want to film your thing on ABC Good Morning America. 
we had 100 press outlets the second day, 1,000 the third day. It just really blew up, right? New York Times, NPR, Atlantic, so forth, right? Like everyone just started covering us. And um, yeah, that's what we realized. It was all inbound. All we did was seed it correctly from day one. And then it just uh, really flew from there. By getting a bunch of people to talk, or as many as you could, which wasn't that many exactly. in retrospect, to talk about you at the same time. Exactly. Uh, the first line in the TechCrunch article mentions that you're a Teal Fellow. This thing was huge for you that you're a Teal Fellow. Um, does Peter Teal or does Teal Fellowship get any portion of this uh, this success? Not at all. No, it's what? a truly yeah, it's shocking, a wonderful, right? Yeah, yeah. The things I've come out of it are like a uh, over like uh, thirty five billion dollars of like value. I think in the companies have been created. Like Ethereum alone, uh, Vitalik made Ethereum as part of the Teal Fellowship. Was a uh, it's a like thirty billion dollar market cap right now. And yeah, Pure Teal doesn't get any of that. He's just I wonder why he structured it. it that way. Why do you think? I think um, you have to structure those incentives really well to convince the best people, right, to like really drop out and do this thing. And so right now, right, it's the most, it's one of the most selective programs, right? Less than one percent get it in, more selective than like any top college. If you're going to convince someone to drop out, like an Ivy League school or Stanford or something, right, like it's, uh, they have a lot of options, right? And so you really do have to make it the best deal. Free money is a pretty good deal, right? So then, why didn't he invest in you afterwards? Why didn't he say, hey, listen, Ben, you guys are raising money. I'll put some money in too. We're friends. I trust you enough that I let you into this program. You should trust me enough to include me in the round. No, yeah, no, yeah, actually, you know, what happened was a round just kind of happened organically where I went to this camp in Lithuania and like uh, met these two really good uh, mentors to me personally who were like, yeah, we'd love to kind of like come in and like make this deal happen. Right. And like what we're doing is not traditionally within the realm of, you know, like a tech company. Right. And so it was a better fit to find these non-traditional investors who are much more like a normal company is this binary thing almost of like you either become a billion dollar thing or you don't. If you take seed funding, series A, B, C, right, you have to go down this specific path. And for us, like uh, these mentors of ours, like very much cautioned us from like doing that, right? Because it really limits what you can do with the business, right? You can't really run this as like a cash flow positive thing or just like go at your own pace, right? Go at the pace that like makes sense as opposed to trying to hit it big or fail catastrophically, right? And so, like, we decided to go with that model. But at the same time, you know, Founders Fund, what Peter Teal runs, has been enormously supportive of a lot of projects and has actually invested in a bunch of Teal Fellowship projects down the line. So it was a good deal flow for them, too. I see. Okay. All right. So it wasn't you that he ended up investing in, but he did invest in others. And Absolutely. the 100000 came with no strings attached. Exactly. Okay. All right. I see this uh, Indiegogo campaign was trying to raise $15,000, which I don't believe you guys were really trying to raise more. You still even made it into a flexible goal, which meant like, hey, guys, we don't even know if we're going to hit 15000 If we don't, we'll still take your money and give you your product. You ended up doing not 15000 but almost $170,000. Yeah, in about 30 days. And at the time, so crowdfunding has grown a lot since then. But at the time, that was the largest amount that anyone had raised for a consumable product. Like a yeah, you know, like something like this. But um, yeah, actually, yeah, you know, we had no idea how much we would raise. We really tried to do our best to like hit a goal that we were confident that we could make. And at the time, like fifteen thousand was basically what we were confident. So tell me, uh, you were saying if you're good at friends, things come to you. So how does how do you get how does your friend get to fly free for life? How do your other friends get to do this? Maybe this is something I could do. Absolutely. So as a frequent flyer, right, you meet a lot of airline employees. And it turns out airline employees have this amazing perk where for their friends, they can actually give you a buddy pass, which allows you to fly uh, first class even, right? Just for the taxes and fees anywhere in the world. And the best thing is it is standby flights, but you almost always get a, a seat because there's always almost room. And then um, you can get up to first class and you can fly anywhere last minute, flexible travel. Cancellations are totally free. There are no fees whatsoever, right? With that. And so you have the most flexible schedule and you can travel as much as you yeah. want for just the taxes and fees. So, if somebody who's listening to me right now, no screwing around, works at an airline, they could give me a free ticket? Absolutely. If you guys do they, become do, your do friends. Do I have to call them yeah. every time I want to fly somewhere? <laughs> no, no. Uh, there's a whole back end that you can use that just like lets you do this on your own. Do I text them and say, hey, I need to go? Or they give me, they give me access to the back end of like United or something? They can do either. But um, if you're good friends with them, they'll just give you access and you can book all your flights yourself. So if somebody's – do they have to – like do they – miss out on giving their husband a free flight because they're giving it to me? No. So there's actually, there are family passes and then there are friend passes. And so they and can give unlimited their friend passes. No, no, no. Each person is limited to generally one or two, but actually shockingly, uh, we talked to a lot of, you know, we make friends with a lot of like airline employees and the most, 
a, a majority of them actually don't use up all their buddy passes. So yeah, if you want to be really good friends with Andrew, you definitely should. So if them. anyone out there has a buddy pass, please contact me and they could just say, Andrew here, you can fly wherever you want. Yeah, you guys should definitely be real friends. But for absolutely, when? that's how it works. For like a year, for a month? As, as long as, long as uh, you guys are friends, as long as they want to have you. As, their as long as they work there and I'm exactly. friends with them. Exactly. I would <laughs> love it if there's someone out there who's a friend. Please, Andrew at Mixergy.com. Is there anything yeah. weird that's going to come up from this? Like, do I? Nothing, right? It just. Yeah. I mean, yeah, as long as you're unexpected. genuinely friends with them. They're not going to get in trouble for it? No, I mean, as, as long, long as, as we're you guys really are, friends. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And it's a good one win because obviously everyone wants to be friends with you, right? I had so. no freaking idea. They, they're gonna, I'm going to ask them when they first lost their virginity. But, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, that's a downside I could see for some people or maybe an upside. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, wh- where do I want to go next with this? So you talked about divorce. Absolutely. You, you finally marry someone. Did you use your, um, your, your pickup tricks to, to meet this woman? Huh. Well, it depends on what you mean by pickup tricks. Because I think ultimately pickup has something that like, you know, Everything I can say right now in this talk, right? The only reason I can have this like coherent talk with you is because of all the things I've learned from pickup, right? I, so, you know what? I get that. Here's yep. I told you I resisted picking up the game for a long time. This girl I was dating who said, it's a well-written book. You'll enjoy it. You should read it. I said, no. The reason I didn't want to is because I didn't want to process. I wanted to find myself in conversation and bring that out in the conversation. I read the book. I love it. It's one of the best books um, I ever read. But it is very process-oriented to the point where – the body language is thought through, right? You're not looking at person directly necessarily. You're kind of looking at them over your shoulder at, like you're about to walk away, right? Uh, they talk about having magic tricks and all kinds of stuff in their bag, right? It is a very process-oriented thing. Are you saying that you didn't use your process but you learned the co- use the confidence way? So it's a, yeah, it's a two-way way. kind of thing, right? Because all these processes – derive ultimately from some fundamental rules, right? That if you derive those, then you don't have to have any specific routine or something like that, right? That is ultimately a crutch that allows you to understand these like fundamental rules that then can allow you to react naturally to any kind of situation. Ah, okay. So the crutch that gets you comfortable in the beginning is you you talk to a girl over your shoulder as you're walking away. The bigger lesson that you take away is don't crowd them and give them the sense that you're exactly. on your way out so that it keeps them from feeling obligated to talk to you all night. Those That's a poor example, but it gives people an idea of what you're talking about. All right. So you used what you learned. You got to meet her. Why did you want to get married? Why not just continue to date? Yeah, this is a thesis I've had with everything in my life, which is um, it's more important to say, like, why not to things? You have to have a really good reason to not do things, actually, in a lot of cases than to do them because – the inherent, like the things that people regret, right, that I found in my life is almost always things that they didn't do, not things that they did do, right? And almost everything that you do, even if it ends horribly, I think is an incredible growth experience. So I knew when I thought about this, it was like uh, Jeff Bezos has this thing he calls a regret minimization framework. And you just think, well, I regret more not having had this opportunity to marry someone and taking it or mar- uh, not doing it at all, right? And so, like, I realized that, you know, there's no way I would regret marrying her and having this incredible deeper experience even if it ended horribly which you know to some extent it kind of did but Why? uh what, what's horrible about the end of it it wasn't uh well you know i was suicidal after we actually divorced so this was last year and uh, you know it was my co-founder and my wife both left kind of the company and our relationship on the same day right and so obviously it was like a reasonably traumatic event at that day but um no i, I can't say it was a horrible thing because at the end it really it was hard right because we had spent almost all our waking hours together with just each other for the past, like, you know, two years. But, um, what I realized is I couldn't regret it ultimately because I knew that I grew so much from that experience. And I needed Why did that you get divorced. I, I've read articles about you. I've got the fast company article where you bring up divorce, but there's never, I, I as far as I could tell, there's no depth in it. What happened? Be as open as you can be. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the most important thing was that, uh, relationships are skill. There was nothing fundamentally incompatible about us. But what I didn't realize at the time, or that I did, but I didn't do well, is that everything is a skill, right? And so I'm amazed with people like you, I think, uh, who like get married and just make it work, right? Because it's like, how do you make things work the first time? It's just like a business, right? My first business failed. My first relationship, my first marriage failed because you make so many mistakes. And like the things that for us went really poorly was um, we didn't have, we couldn't resolve a lot of our conflicts, right? It all came down to communication, right? And like, Later, we learned about attachment theory, right? And like, you know, 
I was more anxiously attached. She was more avoidant attached. So this started this vicious like spiral, right? Where like, you know, when we'd have like some conflict, I try to like push, right? And she tried to like disengage, right? And it just like went so bad over time. And like, we never figure out how to deescalate these things. And so of course, over time, that compounded with the fact that we have a lot of other stuff going on, right? We were both running our own companies and doing all this other stuff. So there's a lot of stress and we never managed to get to a point where we could uh, kind of like step back and resolve a lot of these issues. And like, we also took for granted that like now mistakenly we'll be together. Right. So like nothing, I think this is like a core point where people have this false sense of security where it's like, all right, we're married, right. We'll just always have the time to make things work. And so we can like be worse with each other. And I think like for me, right. One thing I realized is the people I was like worst to in my life, were, like the people I was closest to, right. That I felt most secure around who loved me the most. And that was like really bad. It was like, yeah, I would like get annoyed with like, you know, Daria, my wife, and also like, you know, my mom, right. And things like that. Right. And like, to an extent that I would never do with like friends that were just like acquaintances with, right. It's like, why would I do it with someone that I love so much? But yeah, those are all things I didn't realize until, you know, I had this hard lesson and like things ultimately fell apart. Yeah. I, uh, I feel like if you told me mm-hmm. one out of two people who go into the quinoa restaurant are going to die, yeah. I wouldn't go to the quinoa restaurant, but <laughs> I hear one out of every two, let's suppose that it's an exaggeration. It's one out of every four people who go into marriages end up with the marriages dying. We still go into it. Yeah. And we don't have any skills for it. I don't have any skills. I've read a book about how to date the game. I don't, I don't know a book that really speaks to me about how to stay in a relationship. Yeah. How'd you make it work? What's your secret? Um, we were really committed to making it work and I had, I got, all the fucking out of my system, the ex- the exaggerated enthusiasm that I got. At some point, I said, "I'm going to go do this." It wasn't so much the dating that I got, the the sleeping with the women that that got exciting, though. That was it. Was the I remember watching a TV show on HBO where this guy just woke up with this girl in bed on Sunday morning, and they could just be cuddly together, and they could go and enjoy Sunday together, and who knows what. And in my head, I thought, this is the greatest. This is what dating's about. So I went, I practiced it, like figured out how to date and all that. And you know what? It was good, but it wasn't as good if it wasn't with someone I really cared about a lot, you know? And I thought, well, if you get married, it's all the same thing over and over again. Tell me, is this too much information in your interview? No, this is great. I was sleeping with this one woman. I had sex with her. And I remember going, oh, I know exactly what I need to do next. This is the next part of the routine. I'm not a routine person, but this is the next part. Oh, damn, this is the thing that's happening. Every day is the exact, like, it's like Groundhog Day where it's a repeat. I know I do have a process, even though I didn't start out wanting a process. And then I thought... What I would really like is someone I could build on, a relationship I could build on, someone who's seen me be bad and stupid and just like seen the evolution, someone who sees me devolve and is there to help me recover because she has enough invested in me. And so then I uh, I said, okay, now that is what I want. And the opposite is not this idealistic thing. And so I started looking to find someone that I wanted to be in a long-term relationship with. And that took a long time, especially since I was living in LA at the time. And so every time my wife and I would get into arguments, and we did, there wasn't this thing in the back of my head that was, well, the alternative is so great. The alternative is great. It's not because I, I sucked at it. And if I had more practice, it would it would really be good. No, the alternative is good but it's not as good as being in a relationship. It's not as good as if the two of us can really make this work. And so um, you could tell even in our arguments, even when it got really bad that we still came at it with this connection and with this um, commitment to finding a way to make it work. You know, and for like a while there it would so get like really weird, especially when we moved to Argentina because everything was out of place. And so we'd be angry, but there was no one else to be angry about. You can't get angry at Argentina. You signed up for Argentina, but you can't get angry at someone like telling you why, why don't you just want to eat what's here? Yeah, absolutely. This too, am I in your interview? It is. (laughs) That's an amazing point. I guess it's kind of like being a consultant versus running your own startup, right? Your own baby. Like it's one that's way more fulfilling than just doing these one offs. So, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, I, <laughs> no, I, I don't know that I would liken it to that. I would liken it to, I don't know what to liken it to. I, I don't know. I don't. All right. Let's continue then. All right. You have everything working. Now I understand how the company works without you, right? That you're constantly getting to know people, right? 
TamFam comes comes to you with an idea for chatbots, you invite him to your place, he sleeps over, you get to know him, you guys play Risk till six in the morning and you get a sense of who he is. Some of these people who you get to know end up working for you, running the company. That's why the company ends up running running on its own and it is to this day. Now, like so many other people, you get excited about cryptocurrency. This $10,000 that you told me you invested before, back yeah. when you didn't have much money, ended up equaling how much in value today? Yeah, half a million. Half a million dollars. Yeah, so that's real nice. Half a million in cryptocurrency on some drive somewhere, not even on like some website, and you start seeing the possibility. You take this big possibility and you create this new company called Stream. Stream helps content creators become profitable by using blockchain technology. What's the vision you have for Stream? Where, how does this fit in with cryptocurrency? Yeah, so it's fundamentally interesting that cryptocurrency and blockchain as a space as a whole allow you to have fundamentally different uh, business models and paradigms than were ever possible before. So a traditional company, you have to take a profit, right? You have to take a middleman cut, right? So say, take YouTube, take Twitch, take Periscope. They only work when, one, they lock content creators into the platform, right? If you're on YouTube, you don't want people using Twitch because you don't make money off that, right? You only want people using YouTube, so you lock them in. And then you take a 45% cut of all the things that they make, right? And so fundamentally, you're doing this like uh, you're basically imposing a tax, right? It's like a deadweight loss on the system where like there are some people where this huge 45% cut literally makes a difference between them being able to make this work and not making this work, right? But like ultimately, the system bears this cost because there's no other good alternative. But with a blockchain-based company, you can fundamentally change this model where you don't have to make money off this middleman cut. And so we can make this pie, right? Just 100%, all the money that these content creators make, they get, right? So it's an extremely easy pitch, right? Blockchain is hard for a lot of people to understand, but at the hard day, it comes down to this. We tell content creators with our system, you make all the money, right? You can get 40 to 60% more money in your pocket than you were before, exactly just using our thing. But on top of that, you can make the pie even greater than zero sum, where when the economy grows, when you control your own currency, what you can do is, as more value enters the system, you can distribute that money, in uh, the value, in the form of new tokens, new currency that you create, that you give directly to content creators without, so that they can make real money, real revenue in their pockets without any cost to users, right? And so that's something that is just enormously exciting about the future of the space where we can take out middlemen, uh, make things a lot more fair for the ultimate people who are making value in the system, and also make the pie more than zero sum and give people money that they otherwise never could have made before. Tell me if I understood and remembered what you talked about at lunch. Yep. Here's the idea. I'm a content creator, right? Yep. You go to, uh, you sell coins, let's say 100,000 coins. You, you make yep. them available to people who, are, who might be fans of my work, right? Mm -hmm. You say to them, guys, uh, actually, wait, let me see if I can take this back. You give you create a hundred thousand dollars that I could potentially win based on votes, based on how many people like my work, based on how many people watch my videos, right? Yep. All of these viewers go to watch me and other people. Whoever they watch the most gets a hundred thousand, let's suppose, coins. Now, this hundred thousand coins could be transferred into cash or Bitcoin or anything else, right? So if I want to take my money and run, I take it and I and I, and I go away. More importantly now, other content creators realize, hey, Andrew got 100,000 coins for doing what? An interview? Just a YouTube thing? I could beat freaking Andrew with that. I do these other things on YouTube. Why don't I also be a part of, of Stream? So they're part of Stream, and now they're all competing for this 100,000 coins that you make available on a regular basis based on how many viewers are there. And now you're making it competitive and profitable for some of us to, to be on your platform, right? Yeah, so the gist of it is exactly right. Uh, a couple of nuanced points is uh, it's yes. not one person takes all, right? So you know, if you get 50% of all the views, you get 50% of all the money, right? And the great thing is when more people enter the system, the economy grows, right? And as the economy grows, as more money is entering... How how uh, does how does uh, the economy grow when there are more viewers, more creators on the platform? Exactly. So as more people buy into, say, Stream Token, right, then uh, take money out of Stream Token then there is a larger market cap, for example, right? And when there's a larger market cap, right, generally um, what needs to happen is, uh, you know, either there's each token is representing more money in the system or you create new tokens to capture that new value that was created and you can distribute those directly to content creators, right, and existing stakeholders. 
And so that's what we do. As I see. If, if the value of 100,000 tokens is a buck per token, there's only $100,000 to go around to all the different content exactly. creators, and it's divided based on viewership at first. But if suddenly people are trading each token for 2 or 3 or $5 per, now we have 200000 to $500,000 to divide up among all these content creators. And so that's how it grows. The other way that it grows is you can create more coins for the viewers to give to the content creators. Why would the viewers want to give to the content creators anything? Exactly. So the, the most amazing thing is we don't, uh, this has already been something that people do do, right? So if you're familiar with Patreon, they've given over $200 million to content creators. Live streaming itself already has a huge flourishing transactional economy where users spend over $5 billion in payments to live stream uh, content creators. And so um, that alone has shown that like, users really want to support their content creators and right now like there's a huge push against like people don't want people to be uh like to have like advertising and a lot of things a lot of the time right because they want to be like oh you know like you're true to this work right you're not just telling me this thing because someone paid you to do it right and i think you do an amazing job of this right where you can like be very honest with things that you like actually use but like a lot of people they're just like so angry when they see people do this right they're like man like you know you're selling out, right? Like you're not being true to like what you believe. You're just telling me this because, you know, you got paid to do it, right? And so that's a huge sticking point for a lot of people, right? And so with a lot of uh, people, it's like, man, I wish I could just be pure and like get an earning from just, you know, just what my fans would pay me. But it's impossible to do right now for a lot of people, right? You have to resort to sponsorships or advertising and all that. And so, um, yeah, and then Patreon has changed this model, but it's an extremely painful process for a lot of people. And it's highly non-integrated because of a centralized thing where people, YouTube doesn't want people to use Patreon, right? Because they don't get a cut of that, right? They want people to just stay on YouTube. And so Patreon has to be this huge extra user flow where someone on a content creator is like, hey, please sign up for my Patreon page. I'll give you exclusive videos. It's this whole flow. You go to Patreon, you sign up for a site, you pay the money, and then they have this exclusive paywall content somewhere, right? We can obviate that entire thing, abstract it away, and just with a Chrome extension, have this all happen on YouTube directly, right? So like someone can be like, hey, man, like, you know, if you really like my work, I really want to be pure, right? And I don't want to accept, say, advertising or something. You can just support me directly and I'll give you access to this exclusive content or some other perk, right, immediately as you uh, use our Chrome extension. And they can just tip directly and do that. So that's one reason. So tipping is one, but Patreon also gives rewards, right? If I exactly. give Amanda Palmer five bucks a month, I get, what does she call it? A thing. I get one of her things for five. <laughs> so you guys are planning yeah. to do that too? That's exactly right. And we can integrate that directly on the platform. Ultimately, as we move towards a fully decentralized platform, we can integrate it even more strongly where because we don't care about, you know, anyone on this platform uh, benefits the underlying token, right? So we don't care if you're using one application or another, right? It's great that uh, YouTube, decentralized YouTube and decentralized Patreon work together, right? And they implement this one user flow where on the video you're watching, you can just pay Amanda Palmer five bucks and immediately get access to this like paywall content, right? This thing that she gives you, right? And so, like, that just makes it so much easier and I think makes a lot more sense, but just cannot not be happy, uh, cannot work right now. Can you say how much you're raising or is this one of those quiet periods where you can't talk about it? Yeah, so we're still waiting on some legal clarity before we go fully public. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, we'll be, you know, doing our thing very shortly. So if anyone wants to, yeah, be aware of that, you can go streamtoken.net. And, uh, where where do we find it? Stream what? Streamtoken.net. And, uh, streamtoken. Yeah. Dot Sign up net. for our newsletter there and our discord and slack groups and we'll keep you up and the idea is that if you were to do an ico you would be making a certain amount of tokens available to everyone who wants to, to buy it those people would buy it and sit on the tokens hoping that as this economy grows and each uh token becomes more and more valuable that the tokens that they bought from you become more valuable Right, and that's so, why they would be putting money into your business. No, that's actually not the reason why uh, people are putting money in this business. What we want people to put money in this for, right, is because they want to use this thing, right? And so on day one, it's actually going to be useful, right? Our Chrome extension is going to be live in two weeks. And the reason that people should be buying this is exactly the same reason that they buy live stream tokens today, right? Like, why do people buy $5 billion of, you know, like Periscope hearts and like Twitter cheers, right? It's because you want to support your content creators, right? You want no, but to what about in the ICO? You're saying that people are going to jump... Yeah buy into the ICO because they want to support content creators. Well, there's a lot more in it um, too from that, right? But yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, it's something where one, when you go into the ICO, like you can actually get a lot of the benefits that you get with Patreon for a lot less money with our system, right? Like the incentives are such that like, because essentially we're subsidizing our economy with this, like as the wealth grows, right? We pay out money to content creators and all that, right? Like content creators are incentivized to bring people into the system 
and charge them a lot less than they normally would for things like they get on Patreon, right? Because they get money from other sources. And so, like, if you support the system, you'll be able to support your content creators, have them earn just as much money or more, but pay less yourself, right? And so that's a pretty compelling reason for people to use okay. this. All right. S- stream token. Do- Isn't there a chance, though, before I give it? Mm-hmm. Charlie Lee, the creator of Litecoin, said that one of the things that he doesn't like about ICOs is that you guys could just create this ICO, raise money, and then walk away. You're not under any obligation to continue building the site. You could always say, you know what? This thing didn't work out. We take the money and we go. That's exactly right. And that's why it's so important for people to be transparent, especially in this, and have extremely good governance models. So no matter what we raise, we are committed to actually only spending what we uh, what we would normally raise as a seed stage company, right? So $3 million is all we can possibly spend in the first year by strict governance. And on top of that, we actually make none of this payout for longer than anyone else. We, uh, we have a standard four-year vesting period with a one-year clip. So we're not going to see any of this money for a year. So we're ultra-incentivized to make this thing actually work, right? And I think it's important, and most ICOs don't do this, right? And that's absolutely true. But it's absolutely important for the people in the space to have the best practices, right, in place and to make sure that they don't, you know, they can't just run away with it, right? They actually have to build with the promise they would build. And so we're doing everything to make sure that our incentives are aligned there. Wait, I don't get it. What are you doing to keep, you're saying that you can't, you can't own enough of the business for a certain amount of time, but the people who are investing in the IP, ICO don't own anything other than tokens. They don't own a share of your business. So you could just wait it out, invest, keep the rest of the money and go. No. Well, that's the thing, right? One, they're not investing, right? They're actually just buying so they can have utility in the same way that you're buying. You right. Know, they're buying, they're buying, to- they're buying yeah, tokens. Exactly. They're not even buying a share of the business. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And that's the important thing is, yeah. So like in that case, if we just like sat there and did nothing, right? These tokens would be worthless in a year, right? Because like there's no reason, there's nothing you can use them right. for, the right? Tokens would be worthless, so, but then you still have $30 million or 50 or whatever it is that you raise in the bank. <laughs> you use $3 million of it to... Uh, to in the first few years because you said that's the seed stage and the other forty seven yeah. million dollars is still sitting there as an asset in the business, you could find a way to cash it out. You own the business hundred percent. You don't even have to run what you do by the by the ICO people. Yeah. Yeah. Well ultimately it's a it's an opportunity cost thing for us too, right? Like we could do that. But the reason we're doing this, it's way easier to make money in the space than like do one of these things. My God, this is the busiest I've ever been in my entire life. I was just offered $8 million to run like another ICO, right? Two to three months of work and I get $8 million. I turned that down very specifically because like for the first time in my life, right? I see this one window of opportunity that I've never seen before where we can actually have a chance at dismantling YouTube, Twitch, Periscope, all these companies in the future, right? And so like the payout if we manage to do that is infinitely greater than the short term thing, right? And for me, I'm personally very invested in like a, you know, never sacrificing long term for the short term, right? I think it's a very short sighted thing, right? One, we would all ruin our reputations, right? We've been in space for a long time. Reputation lives far longer than anything else. And like, we would just all be blacklisted from ever doing anything again, right? <laughs> but, but you end up but, with uh, millions of dollars. All right. So I'm not saying anything yeah. about you in this case, but yeah. I do get the risk with these Absolutely. ICOs. I think so, that the opportunity is phenomenal, right? That the investors could end up with tokens that they, that are much more liquid than a share in a startup. The yeah. entrepreneur gets to own 100% of the business and not have to answer to investors. The uh, the customers who own the tokens have an interest that's aligned with the investors who put money up because they bought to I get the value of it. I think we're going to see some tremendous wealth built here. I also wonder about the Ponzi schemes or yeah. – you can't even call them Ponzi schemes – about the schemes that are happening that uh, that we'll only know about four or five years ago, four, four or five years from now, when I interview yeah. one of these guys on Mixergy. And I've got to tell you guys, if you're out there and you're doing any of this stuff, don't be too embarrassed to be on Mixergy. I will interview you. I would love to find out what you guys were up to. So if you're out there doing something weird, I want to know about it. And if you're out there doing something great, I want to know about it. I'm really fascinated by you, Ben Yu. Um, Sprayable is a company I've known about for a long time. I've ha- I happen to, like, we have a writer internally who who did some work for you guys. I remember telling her how skeptical I was about it. She goes, no, I, she told me about how great the product was. So, um, I am, I'm fascinated by you. I hope that I get to know you more as we continue, uh, as you continue to build your business and as you and I continue to live in the same city. And I'm looking forward to hearing what happens with stream as a content creator. I think we need better ways to monetize content and better ways to engage the audience. Thanks a lot, Andrew. All right, streamtoken.net, number one. Number two, the drink that I've been uh, drinking here is called Athletic Greens. Uh, Go check them out. 
They also have, in addition to this greens, they also have this whey protein. And uh, for someone who doesn't eat meat, this is helpful for me. And finally, top tal, no, not finally, top tal if you're looking to hire a developer. And I'm fascinated by this whole airline thing. So if you're out there and you work for an airline, contact me. Even if you don't give me the buddy thing. Andrew at Mixergy.com. I want to know how this works. I'm so fascinated by this. And Ben, maybe we'll be on a cruise sometime. All right. Let's do it. Love it. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Thanks. Bye, everyone.